audience here might be familiar with this with this dilemma should product building be driven by technology or should it be driven by the problem it solves if it is about problem solving then what conversations should we have to make technology an enabler rather than that one shiny object that we run after so to discuss that and to give some insights on that we have our speaker with us tonight dr care williams uh, who will shed some light on this topic so care your camera's on uh, time to hook up the screen sharing etc okay. i'll i'll stop my screen sharing right. while i introduce you to the audience for tonight so uh, dr care williams uh, he's currently a, a senior lecturer in design thinking at the center of uh, center for innovation and entrepreneurship up at the university of bristol uh, he is a creative technologist educator and researcher and he brings with him over 15 years of experience within higher education institutions across multiple roles program leaders senior lecturer researchers and a lot more and his his work is based upon correct me if i'm wrong here uh, is based a lot upon the very core of collaboration and creation of structures that foster learning and creation while being entertained so so that's uh, that's uh, care for us um you'd want to share your screen i'm not sure if it's uh, on i with my face because we're going to have slides for the whole thing so just in 2 seconds um so i was invited today to talk about um the delight of technology or technology as a delightful factor so i'm just going to start with this where are we so screen mm -hmm. there we go can you see that can, get... can everyone see that yes we can looks good so <laughs> to start digital technologies are not delightful right that's kind of my premise i think yeah digital technology structure delightful experiences now it's a subtle difference and i think it speaks to how you introduce this does the technology lead or does the results of what we do with the technology lead so um i've got a quite a varied background um which i think is quite a bonus but i just want to talk a little bit about it before going to kind of my main talk because i think it's worth giving you some context about me and the way that i work so i've got a background in fine art and i just fail at everything at school uh because i was undiagnosed adhd and dyslexic um 18 did an art foundation ended up doing a masters in fine art a masters in computer science and then a phd in computer science with focus on hdi so as an artist these are some of the things i've done i've been an extreme morris dancer i've run a reggae festival across europe i've created giant cardboard sound systems and worked with methodist preachers i've created giant camp performance nights where everyone can dance right now as a researcher so my phd was looking at access and how you work with children with special needs and digital media so it was within the computer science department the focus for my research afterwards has been really on things around the social model access and disability so i've worked with prisoners sorry former prisoners i've worked with kids who are looked after or kids in care i've worked with adults with special needs kids with special needs performance artists with special needs dance companies with special needs a range basically but the focus for my writing is around participatory um ways of working so as an educator i teach at the center for innovation at bristol university i teach 13 different disciplines so they do a major in things like psychology history music theater and they spend a third of their time with us for 40 years it's amazing <laughs> the other side is i work with things like kids here i was working with groups of children with tourette's in tate britain which is one of the main galleries in england um and we were working as researchers so <clears throat> all three of these roles as kind of artist researcher and educator what i do is i try to create structures where people can have fun where they can learn where they can be delighted and where they can make change for themselves all three mixed together which is the joy of my work um so to come back to this idea of technology not being delightful is what you do with it so as an artist i use technology a lot <laughs> pretty much in everything i do 
it's given me a certain kind of understanding of how to use technology, I think. So what I'm going to do is use a single case study of some of my work, which was in Norway, which I thought was quite a bonus. Um, so this was a project, I think 2016, we started, this is 2017, and we've done two subsequent presidencies. Um, it was for the Nordland Academy for Art and Science, and we were asked, well, I was asked to bring together a group of artists and researchers and creative technologists to do a residency. So uh, you're probably going to know this, and I'm going to completely butcher the names of these, and I apologise, but essentially it's in a place called Melbu, which is a small kind of fishing village slash town in Nordland in Norway. So it's up in the Arctic Circle, right on the edge. The map on the right sort of shows you the town, and there's this weird little spit of land at the bottom there, which is where the Norse Fiskin and Fustum Museum, again, sorry, apologise, um, that's where we were based. So we were sponsored by Arts Council England, Nordland Academy, Arts Council Norway, and the Nordland. Again, I'm not going to try and say this. No, I'm not going to try and say it because I will butcher it. So where were we? We were at the Neptune Fish Oil Factory, which is one of the first fish processing plants in the entire world. Um, it's now a, a sort of historic museum, but we were asked to sort of base ourselves here. And what we were asked to do was to consider the landscape and the people and to think, which there's a lot about the Norwegian Arts Council because <laughs> they would fund a bunch of artists to think. But fortunately, particularly for people who organise this, we think through practice and through making. So part of the, the, the original idea of building this factory was that um, a local kind of businessman wanted to use international trade as a way to support local business and local communities. We were based in a giant, giant tank that used to contain fish oil, which is really hard to get the scale of. Um, but we were asked to work in there and create a performance. And then we were asked to work in the Blues Club, which is weirdly just around the corner in another tank. Just to get a sort of sense of scale of this tank, it's got a 20 second response. So when you clap, it will keep on echoing for 20 seconds. It's insane. It's more than a cathedral. It's incredibly high, this vaulted ceiling. So who are we? I was asked to bring together a group of people. So we have Rhiannon Evans. Um, I'm going to just talk about our superpowers because I think it's a nice way to talk about it. So it's a residency. I had to bring together this group of people. It felt like a the Avengers and they all have these certain kind of skills. So Rhiannon Evans is a, a community artist who works with people and technology, but her superpower is to get on and find out stories about people almost instantly. She has this incredible ability to work with people. Joe, who is a sonographer, who builds incredible stage, traditional stage sets, also does projection. Alice Helps, who can build anything out of anything. She's a puppet maker, model maker. Dave Mecken, who's a technologist, uh, composer, uh, electroacoustic composer, um, and a researcher. So me and him both worked on a similar PhD at the same special needs school. It's me. I sort of bring people together, I do a lot of type work, but I also work a lot in video and projection. That's kind of my, my format. And we have Clara de Ronk from Romania, who is a poet and photographer. So we also work with two other people. Marja Buj, again, I'm going to get these terribly wrong, from Norway, um, who is a composer who creates music for context with weird acoustics. So down caves, mines, up giant towers and big industrial blocks. So she composed an entire piece based around acoustics in this tank with us. We then had Svenna Vilbergsen, who is a classical guitarist, who she wrote the kind of second part for. So when we were there, we were asked to consider the landscape, the people and the context. And what we do as a kind of a, as a, in a residency is we, we spend time with people who live there. We walk around, we, we went swimming, we went on boats, we explored the island, right? One of the things that this place has is uh, an asylum centre that goes back, I think, 70 years, maybe 60 years. So we were able to work with locals who were then at the asylum uh, centre. We were able to work with, with local fishermen and uh, get to know them over a kind of a week. So it's not that clear what we actually created yet, and I'll come to that. But one of the things we do is we go to a context, 
and we start to conduct research, right? So our research is both creative, creative, so it might be going and listening, or it might be going and drawing, it might be going reading through documents, and it might be talking to people. So this here, so I'm just gonna share, hopefully share my sound. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't think that's gonna come across that well. Can I just check, can you hear the sound there? Anybody, anybody? Yes, great, good. Yes, got it, yeah. <laughs> So, much. so this is a church that gets rebuilt every so 50, 60 years, I think, but has amazing original pieces. Um, we got toured by a really good friend, well, now a really good friend, Johan. They have this incredible bell that we were able to go up in the loft and record using uh, sort of field recording techniques. And they've created this kind of drone soundtrack, which will become apparent how we use that later. But the idea is that we, we spent time with the guy who lived there. We toured the church, we recorded sounds, I took, took some photographs, I think one of us did some poetry. Now, we were then able to go into um, a, the house for the church, for the priest. And in there, there was some of the locals from the asylum seekers a centre, and there was a local historian. And she told us something, it was really interesting, it was a bit of a serendipitous thing, but I'm just going to play this and then talk about it. So one of the things she told us was that when uh, kind of wives were waiting for husbands to come back on the fishing boats, they'd walk up and down in front of this window and it would make this kind of mark in the floor. We talked to Mohammed, which isn't his real name. Um, he gave us permission to show his photo, but we'd rather not use his name. But he told us about the fact that he traveled across Europe. Um, and when he got to Norway, he by this point lost both his mum, his dad and his sister. And he says he wakes up every morning and he looks out a window, sorry. Oh, it's really got me, because he still hasn't met him. But every, sorry, every day he gets the window and he'd look out and he'd hope that ferry had them on it. And for us, there was that moment of serendipity where the kind of research we were doing, the kind of conversation we were having, had this point where these two things matched. There's a window. So, this comes back to Rihanna. So she is amazing at talking to people and getting ideas out of people. So one of the things she uses is kind of simple broadcast technologies. And at the time she used to think of Periscope, which is probably quite old hat now. It allows you to broadcast out to the world and anyone can kind of join your stream. Whilst talking with some of the locals from the asylum centre and some of the kind of locals who have been born there, um, we were having a conversation about the sea and a rebel in Syria who was in the fighting joined them and started to talk to them, right? And there's just this moment of bizarre connection that this simple te technology and the kind of things that we did enabled, where you've got someone from Syria who's currently fighting, you had a local person who had been involved in fishing throughout generations, you had a local family that had maybe only been there a few months. And it was kind of enabled by this simple conversation, but also the technology. So we were really taken by this idea of Dugnad, and we probably sort of, misconstrue this in a way because we're not from Norway, but this idea of helping, helping to help, right? Um, and this idea of, so from, from the fishing factory where everything that you can use international kind of, um, let me see, you can think internationally to support local. That's where I was going with this. And what, what we started to see was connections in the landscape, connections in the history, connections of the people that lived there that just had these fleeting moments, these fleeting kind of poetic moments that we thought we might be able to connect. So one of the things we did uh, was to keep a blog. And I just want to come back to technology because I know you're a product designer and we're talking about technology here and don't worry, we'll get back to that. But I'm just gonna read this quickly for you. So this was day three. Prints arrive, are laid out for display. Chairs found by the fixer. Connections are made, LEDs hung. Oh, so many LEDs. It's 12 degrees and wet. Colder in the tank, sand is deceptive and looks warm. Some luggage lost, materials missing. Alice melts wax, Johan fixes her lenses so she can see. Maya and Spazia play, share food histories. 
So this is when we're starting to kind of meet, work out what we're doing, kind of literally lay out our technology. Key rise plans in my notebook, which was a gift. Structures and projections combined in the bowl. Mythical moving, then disappointed. Tangible, no repair possible, so plain plans change. Materials transfer for Hackney Personal and Digital. So we spent months developing our own custom LED drivers, the system. We had one little black box that we needed to do something that we got very expensive, custom made for us. It broke. Like, this is the week we're trying to create this thing. It sort of meant this entire kind of generative algorithmic LED system that we're trying to create was just bunk. Now, it was upsetting. <laughs> it was difficult. You can see Dave there having a little poignant moment. But it wasn't the technology that upset us or let us down. It was the circumstances and the things that we were trying to do. So I like this. I work with simpler technology, turning late, still bright at night. That's Rihanna. Oh, sorry. Bird's call, oyster catcher, lap wing again, the haunting curlew. So she worked with things like acetates, pictures, sounds. And what was really interesting after this was that it stopped our focus on technology. So particularly the technologists in the group. And we start to return to what we had. So one of the things that we started to do was use pinhole cameras to take uh, solograms. I started to mix that in. Dave created a, a flocking sequence using his computer um, that we used for the projection to kind of replace the LED. So this is kind of what we resulted in. So we created an installation in one of the tanks. It's really hard to do this in 10 minutes, but this is, this is just a quick video. Now it's a GIF because it's quite hard to stream, so I've made it quite low grade. Um, but it should give you an idea of the kind of sense of how it felt to be in the tank. You need to leave everything behind. Turkia, um, uh, Greek, after uh, uh, Macedonia, and uh, Serbia, and Croatia, uh, and Hungaria, and Posteria, and Germany, and Spain, and Norway. <laughs> There is a window towards the sea where people went back and forth to for their families at sea. But the weather was bad. And they walked there so many times that there is a part the, on the floor. The same coin with different faces. So, <laughs> not the easiest thing to see because. The way we created it was that we had a giant statue in the middle. I'm oh, sorry, let me just stop this. There we go. We had a giant structure in the middle, which the kind of performer sat in the middle of. What we did is we had three points of projection, which I mapped onto that giant wooden sculpture. Now the wooden sculpture was in the form of a kind of a leviathan, because we'd seen part of the skeleton of a whale washed up. Um, now I projected onto that and mapped it. I used lots of different videos and photographs and also some of the recordings of the people that we work with and what we did is we mixed that with sound and with the sound we had a sort of surround sound system so we had eight point speakers with this incredible echo and we used an algorithm um, based on a thing called touch designer that allowed us to create a sort of a generative scape of sound and projection right so we accompanied the people performing and had our own moments of kind of performance as well so underlying this was quite a lot of technology, right? I want to come back to this. I just want to talk, talk a little bit about what the technology allowed me to do in this project, or enable me to do, I think is more the point. So I talked about technology as structure for delightful experiences. So what is the structure I'm talking about? So for me, there's several, right? That are creating frameworks for people to share their stories and experiences. So the people that we talk to, the kind of the histories we uncover, the bits of conversation, the sounds of the bells, the sound of the light as it moves across. So that picture in the background is a sonogram that I created just next to the, I'm um, sorry, I didn't create, and created next to uh, one of the main tanks. So the technology allowed us to organize this. I mean, it was in Norway. I hadn't met these people even before I come over. I had to organize six people, all from different parts of the country and two different countries to all get there. Seems like a simple one, but it was what made it possible. We used it to document what we did, but also document the kind of the work that we were doing with people. So when they're telling us stories or ideas. 
allowed us to have a creative process. So mixing and projecting and editing using technologies allowed us to kind of refine this content that we were generating. So there was a process there, right? Finally, it allowed us to stage something quite spectacular and, dare I say it, delightful, right? One of the things that underlied it was this algorithm, right? And one of the things you could claim and has been claimed for this kind of work. So it's an algorithm decides what's being played when within certain commands. But we remove our authorship and we allow other voices to come through. Now, I think that's very limited. It's still very much our work using other people's stories and glimpses. So on that point, the work we do is a moment in time where we can collect stories, ideas, and we can kind of present that to the people that we do, right? But we're not going to fix the world. We're not going to tell everyone's story. But I think there is some messy good, there is some delight, there is some joy, there is some, you know, some humanity in this project. And for me, the technology enabled us to do this, but it wasn't the thing. It wasn't the thing that was delightful. It wasn't the thing that was joyful. It wasn't the thing that choked me up earlier, right? Those are the stories and the things that allowed us to collect. Finally, it allows me to talk to you today. It allows me to present my work in this way. So coming back to you as product designers, because I suppose it's quite a lot of you going, okay, this is interesting. For me, it's quite a simple point is that if you separate this idea of the technology embodying all the joy and delight or the, the, the experience you want to create and you think about it as a tool or a material or as a structure to create delight or experience or joy, you have a more nuanced understanding of the product and how it will be used, which in the long run is a good thing. So I just want to finish with um, my email. That's my website on the right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, all of my work's based on collaboration, everything I do, um, from my teaching to my research and my art. So I would really love if anyone wants to get in contact, whether it's just have a conversation or to do a project, I'd really love that. And I'm going to stop there. Cool. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Fantastic. Uh, let me see if my screen comes up. It does. So back in Norway again. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Care, for, for, those, uh, for the presentation. So we'll begin with the Q&A. We do have a couple of questions already here. Um, let's see. So the first one is, so what technique do you and your team uh, use uh, when you try to find correlations between the different kind of research that hmm. your team conducts? Bigger question, because I think if I was answering that as a straight research question, it would be, well, I have this particular form of synthesis. I think what's quite exciting for us is that we do it by kind of hammering it out and making and trying to build things, right? So we'll literally go out and talk to people. We're trying to collect that. We'll try to listen a lot, but we'll also make sure that we have some kind of notation because each of us notates in a different way. But, I mean, Alice used to sculpt, and that was her form, right? And mm. it's combined those things in a way. It's, I don't think there's a simple solution to it. I think for me, it's time and experience is the way that we do it. So our experience, having done this before, but also the experience of being together. Right. Okay. So, so building some kind of a common language between the people who are doing this research and then going ahead and do it. Frankly, we lived in a house together for <laughs> 10 days and didn't kill each other and cook together and went swimming together. It, yeah, right. it helps. Okay. So uh, the next one is, does do ideas, uh, so let's see, do ideas push the limits of technology or do te does technology opens up for new ideas? That's a great question. I think it's both. If you think of it as a tool or material, right? One of the things I like to do is think, you know, like an instrument. You know, you 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 have an instrument that you learn, you perfect, right? Say violin, but also that technology changes as you learn that instrument. So I think it's always going to be this dialogue, right? So I suppose when I'm saying not having technology lead, the, the technology can lead, but you need to consider it as a material or as a thing, as a tool still. It's right. not just the thing. I know, I, yeah, yeah. It can enable a lot of things. It can open up new avenues, perhaps uh, use it as an enabler. Think about loop as well, though, right? Of, of you use a technology. So a lot of what we do is misusing technology. There's nothing that complicated in there. Most of it's simple. Most of it's open source. Mm -hmm. But it's about using and trying and playing with it, which mm -hmm. is when it's really exciting. Right. OK, so thanks for that. So the next one is when you come up with an idea, you, um, so let me see. When you come up with an idea, you want to present 
when you come up with an idea that you want to present, okay, uh, how do you find the technology, uh, the technology to make the idea come to life? Well, it's interesting because again, sometimes I will start with the technology. So um, sometimes, well, particularly with say projection, right? I have an idea that I want to project through. I want to use some form of pattern. Particularly with this, I was looking at kind of um, algorithmic kind of you know simple rules for developing things like squares. But then also looking at things like flopping. So I literally got that giant wooden structure, put two projectors on it, had about thirty different videos, and then live mixed those in. So it was very much like I, it wasn't just me going. I will project this exact thing. Mm. I map on, and then I just we had a, like a day of just playing in the space, which is quite hard with technology because you have to get to that point. But that's the fun bit. Mm. So we, I, I had like a VJ desk basically. So for me, it's it's again, it's a bit both, right? Sometimes the technology will flick into place, and you go, oh, "I need that technology." Sometimes the technology itself gives you the ideas and the use of it as material, which is why I think of it as material. Right. Oh, well, makes sense. Um, next one is we have quite a few questions uh, today. So, uh, can you give an example where technology did not work as a delight factor in one of your installations? Yeah. I mean, do you know what? Actually, yeah, I really can. So, I did a project um, for a museum in Bristol fairly recently where um, it was 70 years of Bristol music because Bristol is quite well known for music. Mm. Uh, one of the things I quite interested is all the history. So I got a chance to record an interview with someone from each decade in the last sort of 70 years of Bristol music, about six, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, so what I asked them to do was to talk about track music that meant something to them. So my kind of thesis for this was that no one ever listens to stuff in museums. So I had I, I was at an oral history presentation and it's full of oral history professors. And I said, have you ever spent more than five minutes listening to oral history in a museum? And they said, no, not one person, and other than their own, obviously. So I got them made into records, right? So the idea, uh, you could take a record out of sleeve, you could put it onto a record player and you would sit and listen, right? Which for me was like, it becomes more delightful, it's about time to Now, when it got installed, there was a few cuts, and one of the things I wanted was a comfy chair, the, the records out, so they got scratched. Now, what they did was have them locked away, you had to ask them, they were a little bit too far away, and it was really, really loud. And for me, it ruined the piece completely, right? And actually, it was a bit too late to change it at that point. But it was just this subtle, subtle difference, I think, between how the technology was placed. You know, literally, the comfy chair wasn't close enough, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't accessible enough. I mean, the technology suddenly changed from being brilliant and no one listened to it at all and being completely undelightful. So I just, I, I really love, I always keep that in my mind, that kind of little tweak that would have changed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. So you have a reference to work with next time, the best practices of to-dos and not to-dos as well. That's equally important. Um, the last question I have right now is, so design thinking, was, was that a part of your toolbox for this project? It's interesting. My official title is Senior Lecturer in Design Thinking. I'm trying to move it to design innovation or design research. Not that I have anything against design thinking. I teach it. Mm -hmm. I think it can sometimes be a bit of a shoehorn for previous more developed theories because it's quite tangible and quite easy to think of as a thing. So as a researcher, I kind of follow um, a sort of much more sort of thematic qualitative approach right in my kind of art practice i have a very particular kind of approach and i'm completely losing my point here sorry let's go back to the question can you give me the question ADHD. so was design thinking a part of the toolbox uh, in this project is for me design thinking highlights particular processes so i could easily talk about this project in terms of the stages of design thinking because i think they align quite well I wouldn't say I consciously went up, oh, so I'm thinking I will, you know, do my testing and then I will do da, 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 because it's it's a bit more cyclical and also a bit more awkward is the idea with this kind of research. That said, design thinking is a really good way of thinking through some of this stuff. And I think you could very easily apply this um, design sort of this kind of project, you could easily see how design thinking would have worked through this. Right. So while while it does offer the structure. From your perspective, you are naturally structured. <laughs> no, 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 what I'm saying is that it comes from somewhere else, which is definitely not me. You know, sociology, you know, you've got, there's just a very long history of this kind of investigation, ethnography, creative practice that goes back 100 years. 
that isn't just from design thinking. So what I'm saying is design thinking is a kind of flavor of that. Mm -hmm. You can definitely see that in the work that I'm creating, but I didn't consciously use design thinking. Right, makes sense. <laughs> Dig myself cool. out. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, okay. I think, uh, so that was all the questions we had today. Um, thank you so much for uh, spending the time yeah. preparing the presentation and being there uh, for speaking tonight. And also thank you to Microsoft for sponsoring the event. So um, that's all for today evening. Uh, look forward to the audience next time then. And uh, all of you have a good evening. Take care. Bye-bye.